Well, good morning again. If you would make your way to your seats, and as you go, you can open your Bibles to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 130. Let me see if this microphone's going to attack me anymore. Psalm 130. As you know, we're going through a, a series in the book of the Psalms. We have a couple more weeks to go. And then in December, we're going to have a, a four-week Advent series. We're going to talk about four different uh, identities or aspects of who Jesus is as we celebrate his coming over Christmas. So that'll begin the first week in December. So very much looking forward to that. Um, before we launch the message, I also want to thank you uh, for your investment. Many of you invested in the, the coat drive that we did for the teachers of this school uh, as they seek to hand out coats to those uh, in this school community who need them over, over uh, the, as the cold winter months roll in. Um, we, we are going to be able to fill their complete uh, complement of coats that they need for all the different sizes. Uh, so thank you for doing that. It's a way really we can serve the children and serve this school that obviously serves us. Uh, greatly by hosting us here. So thank you for those of you who invested in that drive. Very grateful to be able to communicate that to them this week. Well, uh, as I said, turn to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. And as we open this psalm to read, let's remember two things. First, that this is God's word, which means it's authoritative. It's the word that we bring our lives underneath. It has power to transform us. And secondly, that it's God's word to us. In all of our various seasons, the younger, the older, single, married, still at home, trying out a new first job, retiring, this is God's word to us. Let's read that word, Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths... I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. The SS Edmund Fitzgerald was an American Great Lakes freighter that sank in a Lake Superior storm on November 10, 1975, with the loss of the entire crew of 29. When launched on June 7, 1958, she was the largest ship on North America's Great Lakes, and she remains the largest to have sunk there. According to a couple of authors, Ackerman and Knox, who have studied this sinking, they said at 7 p.m., a, another vessel in the area, the Anderson, made radio contact with the Fitzgerald and had her on their radar. When they asked how the Fitzgerald was making out, they replied, we are holding our own. This was around 7.10 p.m. Shortly afterwards... The Fitzgerald disappeared from the Anderson's radar screen. Ackerman and Knox comment that the sinking of the Fitzgerald was, in their opinion, likely very rapid, and it is likely they did not know the seriousness of their condition. Indeed, after the wreck, a severely damaged lifeboat was found and only part of the second. The conditions of the lifeboats suggest that no attempts were made to leave the ship. And no distress signals were ever issued. Like the captain of the Fitzgerald, this psalmist is facing a storm. In this case, it's a spiritual storm. It's a storm of the soul. 
unlike the captain of the Fitzgerald, he does not feel that he is holding his own. Rather, he feels he is already in the depths and is sending passionate distress signals in hopes of a divine rescue. Since this very personal psalm is written in God's word, we are to assume that this psalm invites us to take stock of our storms of conviction as well and ask whether we also are walking or longing for or hoping in toward the rescue of God's mercy. Here's here's the overarching point of this psalm. Here's the the main idea. Conviction, when we experience it, conviction is a means to lead us through the sorrow of our sin to the celebration of God's mercy. Let me encourage you to, to write that down or process it in your mind right now. Conviction, the feeling of conviction, that weighty feeling that comes upon us when we know we have done something wrong. It has an intended effect that's supposed to take place in our heart. It's supposed to lead us through the sorrow of our sin to a celebration of God's mercy. That's what's happening in this psalm. This psalm is feeling a a weighty feeling on his soul. He compares it to being down in the depths. You can imagine a person who's sinking under the water and is feeling the, the weight of water pressing down on his lungs, the need for air. That's what this psalmist is describing, his experience. And we learn from the rest of the psalm that this experience is, is not just general suffering. He references throughout the psalm his, his, his sense of weightiness is because of his sin. Notice that if you look down there. The, the weightiness happens because of his iniquity. Verse 3, if you should mark iniquities, who would stand with you? There is forgiveness, so sin is in view here. He says later on that there is plentiful redemption and that the Lord that he is calling out to in verse 8 will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So I, I don't think that this psalm is primarily focusing on circumstantial suffering. Contrary to maybe how these verses are often applied, um, you know, in refrigerator magments at the Christian bookstore. Wait for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. Now, certainly it is true that we wait for the Lord's deliverance from physical calamities. Uh, Like a sailor might cry out to the Lord for deliverance as a, a ship is sinking. But I think what's in view in this psalm, in light of his repeated reference to sin, is is the weightiness that comes on him because he is aware of his sinfulness. And to him it feels like waves pressing down upon him. Out of the depths comes his voice crying out to God for a rescue. So this psalm might be described as the experience of a saint under conviction of sin. What is to happen when a storm of conviction comes on your heart? What are you to do? If you're the captain of your own fate, so to speak... What are you going to do as you feel conviction of sin? Are you going to, am I going to say, we are holding our own? Or like this psalmist, will you send up a distress signal of the soul? Will I? How do we respond to the sense of conviction. That's what this psalm is designed to provide for us. It's it's providing a manual for the convicted saint. A manual for the convicted follower of God. What are you to do? What should take place when you experience the Lord's hand pressing upon you? The psalm is broken out into four stanzas. We'll walk through each of them in turn. Let's look at the first one. The first one we might label a deep conviction of sin. Notice his opening cry. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas. Notice this, for mercy. So the first thing we're aware of is this psalmist is desperately aware of his conviction As we we said later, you notice down there that it is his iniquity and his need for forgiveness that is pressing upon him. And so what does he do? He calls out to the Lord. Out of the depths, he says, I am crying to you. I desperately need your mercy. Please hear me. Please receive my cry. 
So the psalmist starts with, with this man is, is in a deep sense of alienation from God because of his sin. He feels as though he's a drowning man being sent down to the depths because he is aware of how many iniquities, how many sins are present in his life. And he's also aware that the only person who can rescue him from this experience of guilt and sin is the Lord. So he cries out and uses the language of a drowning man, I am falling, save me, rescue me. We, we might bring to mind the biblical story of Jonah, as Jonah is thrown over the boat and he's sinking into the waves. That's the depiction we might have of this man. This man is, as it were, he's drowning under a sense of his own failures and his own sin. This week, after I was reading about the, uh, the Fitzgerald, I also read briefly about the Estonia, which was an ocean liner uh, in the 90s that sank and took, took down hundreds of people uh, with it, at least that were, were sent into this chaos of trying to survive while this ocean liner is sinking. And one account of describing what might have been experienced by some of the people said this about a particular man who was trying to, to survive in this, in this water as the ship went down. The wave that took him caught him by surprise, it says, hitting so quickly that he didn't see it coming, and he had no chance to draw a breath. He was pulled below the surface, came up, and was pulled below again on what seemed to him to be a long, long trip. The ocean bubbled and roared around his ears. He says later, survival in the water was a desperate affair. The night was rent with the cries of invisible victims, pleading for help, growing weak with the cold, moaning, going silent, and losing the fight to stay alive. Nothing could be done for them. That's what this man feels when he thinks about his sin. He, he looks at it and he feels like a drowning man. He feels that there is nothing anyone can do for me. And yet, there is a note of faith in this psalm that it is directed towards the Lord. His cry is towards the Lord. The great example that this psalmist gives us, gives us from the outset is that he is not like the Fitzgerald crew claiming we are holding our own. Brothers and sisters, let me try to impress on all of our hearts the great danger of our age. The great danger is to say, like the Fitzgerald, we are holding our own we are minutes away from destruction. We are not holding our own when it comes to sin. We are not capable of surviving in this hopeless affair. We are surrounded by evidence of our own ineffectiveness at battling our own sin. And yet we are capable, unlike a sailor, of continuing to deny our need even as we plunge below the waves. Now, whenever the moment was, there was a moment when those sailors knew we're not holding our own. Actually, when they found the wreckage, there was at least a sailor who was able to get a life jacket on. So there was a moment. They couldn't get the lifeboats probably unhinged and everything, but they, they were at least aware as the ship went down, oh, we, we are in trouble. And yet, Christians, certainly those who are not Christians, but even Christians can be sinking under the weight of some area of sin in their life and yet continue to deny the severity of their need. We can all do that, can't we? We all have some area of rebellion where we're capable of saying we are holding our own, even as we are succumbing to severe expressions of rebellion against God. We're capable of denying the pressure of God's conviction. This man is held up to us as a model. This is what should happen to us when we experience conviction. We should say, Lord, rescue me. Rescue me from this sin. It is pressing on me and my awareness of it. It, it is not a trait of spiritual health or vitality when in the midst of succumbing to sin, your demeanor and attitude is, I am holding my own. That's not a sign of health. That's a sign of insanity. That's a sign of catastrophe. So be honest with yourself right now. What would your close friends, parents, spouse say if, if they were to say, does this person, do you think that you desperately need the mercy of God to help you overcome your sin? 
Or would their experience of your sense of confidence be, I, I think that they think, he thinks, she thinks, that he's holding his own. She's holding his own. No distress signals are coming up. Listen, when's the last time you sent up a desperate distress signal to the Lord that sounded like verse 1 and 2? The beginning of experiencing God's mercy in our walk, in our everyday walk, it begins with acknowledging our need for him. You can't experience mercy unless you acknowledge need. That's the definition of mercy. Mercy comes to those who have great needs. Mercy is not a, a crown for the head of the self-confident. Mercy is a rescue wrath for the drowning. And if you can't acknowledge that you're drowning, you're never going to cry out for it like this psalmist does. What does it mean for a Christian to celebrate the mercy of God? It begins by acknowledging need. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Out of the depths of my conviction about my anger or my self-righteousness or my lust or my lack of self-control or my impatience, out of those depths I cry to you, Lord, have mercy on me. Be honest with yourself. Don't rush to change your behavior for the next week. Begin by acknowledging, when is the last time I sent up this kind of distress signal about the condition of my soul? Do I look more like this godly man who is willing to acknowledge his need or more like a sailor saying, we are holding our own? Let's admit it. Let's admit our need. First of all, a desperate and deep conviction of sin. That's the beginning of experiencing God's mercy. Secondly, secondly, a desperate hope in God's forgiveness. Look at verse 3. He continues to meditate on the reality of his condition. Not only is he desperately needy and unable to save himself, he acknowledges that the Lord, the Lord is under no obligation to rescue him. Do you notice that in verse 3? If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, oh, Lord, who could stand? So he moves from this, this drowning uh, picture to a, a place that's somewhat more legal. It's a courtroom. He's saying, look, Lord, the one I'm calling to, if you were to recount and add to my account the list of my sins, internal and external, Lord, who could stand? No one could stand. No one could, could stand. If you, if you keep the same image of the drowning man, it is as though this man is saying, here I am drowning, and yet, Lord, imagine if, if you were just counting against me my sins. It'd be like adding weights to my shoulders. Further and further down I would go. If, if you began to assign to me the guilt of my many moments of impatience, my frequent self-righteousness, my frequent impatient tongue, my anger, my cravings, my pride. Oh, I, I would feel that, that no one could stand before you. Listen, brothers and sisters, the definition of our faith is that we acknowledge the holiness of God and his right to judge those who rebel against him. God is not under any obligation to rescue sinners outside of himself. He's not like the judge who must uphold the law or he will be liable. God is the law and his law has been broken and he is under no obligation to do anything but punish those who have a long list of iniquities. So let me ask again. When is the last time that you personally acknowledge to the Lord, Lord, if you mark my sins against me, I would have no hope of any future of life. My only hope would be your judgment. My only expectation would be your judgment. See, we can, we can talk about the grace of God, and, and suddenly it starts to seem like a right to us. Especially we, we live in the land of rights, inalienable rights. Listen, grace is not an inalienable right. Right? People are not endowed by their creator with an alienable grace. They are not. They are endowed with an alienable privilege of being made in God's image, incredible provision of God each and every day, an amazing creation that shouts his glory, even the gift of his word which defines following him. That's what they're given. 
and they're required to follow hard after him. They are not assigned inalienable grace simply by being alive. That's what this psalmist is saying. If you marked iniquities, Lord, no one could stand. Part of the experience of conviction is acknowledging the severity of it in light of God's holiness. Brothers and sisters, let me especially talk to those. I had a particular burden for those who have been Christians for a lengthy period of time. Maybe you've grown up in the church, and I think these first uh, four verses can, can often seem like a foreign experience to my daily walk. It's almost as though this psalm is for the one-time moment when you came to the Lord, and then it's forgotten for the rest of your journey. But but I think we have every reason to expect that this man is a saint. He's already a believer, and he's declaring to the Lord his desperate need, his ongoing dependence on God's mercy. We never outgrow our awe at God's grace, that if God should mark even just the sins of this week, we could not stand. Our, our, our bursts of foul language at that difficult job moment, our contention with the boss, our little white lies to protect our reputation. Look, even just this week, if we marked those iniquities, no one could stand. Brothers and sisters, especially those who have been in this faith for a long period of time, Please, let's consider, evaluate your last week and months. When is the last time you had a deep, heartfelt acknowledgement that apart from Christ, there would be no standing, that even to this day, you are not holding your own? Now, hopefully you've grown. Hopefully you're more mature. Hopefully you're less ungodly than you were at one point. And yet, still today, there are enough marks to declare, if you should mark these iniquities, I could not stand. I still to this day am not holding my own. I still to this day declare that I need your mercy. I am an ongoing recipient of the mercy of God desperate hope. And notice, notice how he concludes. That would be the case that no one could stand if the Lord should mark iniquities, but the surprise comes in verse 4. With you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. A, A remarkable turn of phrase in that verse. Those who acknowledge that God has no obligation to forgive sinners, are therefore amazed that he does forgive sinners, and in that awe, they worship and honor him as Lord. Those who who minimize sin and act like forgiveness is an obligation of the Lord do not fear the Lord. So one way you can know if you are impressed with forgiveness, if you're amazed with forgiveness, one way you can know, do you fear the Lord? It is those who are amazed by forgiveness because that implies the right of God to judge sin. Those are the ones that fear the Lord. Those who count sin a small thing do not fear the Lord. Those who acknowledge, you are holy. You have no reason to forgive me. You have no obligation to forgive me. You're not obligated because of how I grew up. You're not obligation because I'm, I'm nicer than my neighbor or I've done less bad things than my friend. You're under no obligation to be impressed by my godliness. And yet with you, there is forgiveness. And the result of that forgiveness is that you would be feared, a holy God who forgives sin, who chooses to not mark iniquity, who chooses to bring mercy to the rebellious. Those sailors on that ship, they hadn't done anything probably, uh, you know, practically to deserve going down in that storm. But our storm is very different. Every inch deeper into those waves is a voluntary choice of rebellion against God. We're not innocent sufferers of God's righteous judgment. We're willing rebels who continually look for ways to minimize God in our life. And yet with that God, there is forgiveness with the result that he is feared by those who acknowledge his holiness. Listen, if if you don't currently fear the Lord, if there's an area of your life where you're not fearing the Lord, one culprit is 
You've become familiar with the forgiveness of God. There's a desperate hope, you sense, a desperate hope. Without forgiveness, I would be lost. And yet, surprise, there is forgiveness so that you may be feared. A desperate hope in God's forgiveness. Now, please put this in your everyday life, your every week life. Let's imagine, do the snapshot right now of your last weeks and months. Have there been moments where you looked like verse 1 and 2 and verse 3 and 4? Have there been moments like that? Be honest with yourself. Have there been moments where you said, Lord, my iniquities are over my head. I desperately need your mercy. And Lord, if I didn't have mercy, I would have no hope but with you, there is forgiveness. Does that sound like a conversation you've had with God recently? If you have to go back weeks and months or years, the last time you had a conversation that sounded something like that, that is going way too far back. That means there's been a familiarity with sin. If you can never remember a conversation like this with the Lord, let me impress upon you. You might not be saved. I say that with great gravity and caution. But if there's never been a conversation like this with God, I desperately need your mercy. Without your mercy, I am hopelessly lost. Then that is evidence that there, there might just be a lack of conversion. That's what your conversion consisted of acknowledging that you were a sinner, that without the Lord Jesus Christ you had no hope, and yet that you believed in his forgiveness. If, if you can never remember a conversation like this with the Lord, and certainly after you're a Christian, you have these conversations in an ongoing way. Not for the first time. It's not as though you, you lose forgiveness, but you're freshly aware of your need for it. You're freshly crawling out to God and, and declaring, yes, Lord, here's another evidence of my need for your forgiveness. Forgive me for that sin. It's not as though God doesn't forgive sin that we don't know about or we've forgotten about or that is unconfessed. But if we have known sin and we continually neglect to acknowledge it before God, it's a sign of hardness of heart. Be concerned if, as a Christian, nothing like this conversation with the Lord is present in your life in an ongoing way. There's a desperate hope, I think, in God's forgiveness. You know what I think we do sometimes? We feel bad about a certain area of our life, and then you know what we do? We try harder. I think that's most Christians. We feel bad. i, I got to be nicer to my spouse. And then we try harder. I, I gotta respect my parents a little bit more than I gotta be you know, a little more respectful. And we try harder. I, I gotta stop watching that stuff. And then we try harder. We feel bad, and then we try harder. But we are not the religion of trying harder. We're the religion of encountering God, experiencing His mercy. Is there a try harder to do? Yes, but it's not the Savior. It's not God. We're not a try harder religion. This isn't, but I, I got to learn how to be a little more, a little more, you know, self-controlled. Okay, I'll try harder next week. No, no, that's not Christianity. Christianity is encountering a holy God who gives mercy to sinners and re-encountering him and encountering him again and meeting with him again and experiencing again the joy of saying, Lord, Lord, here I am again. And if you should mark this against me, I would have no hope. But good news, with you there is forgiveness. Look, repentance and this experience of affirming the forgiveness that is present for us in Christ, it should be the ongoing experience of our Christian life. It, it, it should come up consistently, regularly, daily, probably, Certainly weekly, that there should be this experience of, of even if it's just a brief moment, Lord, Lord, I, I need your, your mercy, and, and yet with you there is forgiveness. There's a desperate hope in this man in God's forgiveness. Thirdly, there is an enduring faith in God's promises. Notice, and here's the, here's the refrigerator magnet verse, right, that everybody knows. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. So somehow, 
Though he expresses a confidence in forgiveness in verse 4, did you notice that? His full experience of that promise is something he is still having to anticipate. Do you notice that? It, it, this is not a psalm like other psalms that you can kind of sense the change in his emotional state. You, you notice that like in verse 4 it says, with you there is forgiveness. He doesn't immediately go to, I rejoice in the forgiveness of the Lord and he's rescued me and great is the Lord and greatly... De-. He doesn't do that. Here, here he goes from expressing his confidence and forgiveness to then saying, I wait for the Lord. I wait for the Lord. There's the sense that his experience of that forgiveness, his seeing it, his knowing it tangibly is something he's still having to express faith towards. Now, I think this is true both emotionally in our walk with the Lord and also ultimately in the sense that our confidence in heaven and the final forgiveness and the revelation that, yes, we are actually in heaven uh, when God's great judgment comes and we are not cast away, we are ushered in, it, it's, a, it's an expression of faith right now. We're not in heaven right now. We're, we're waiting to see definitely that God has forgiven us. And we can believe that and receive assurance of that and express confidence in that, but it's, it's, a, it's a matter of faith right now. It's believing it. It's not seeing it. For the saints that are actually in heaven, they don't have to have faith in God's forgiveness anymore. They know that he's forgiven them because they're right next to him and they're not dying. They, they know that he's forgiven them. But as long as we're in this life, we're... There's a waiting element. There's a faith element. And for this man, I think emotionally, it's almost as though his sense of God's redemption and forgiveness is is something he's still looking forward to. He still feels as though he's in the night of uncertainty. I I wonder, this is speculation, but I wonder if his, his sense of guilt, his sense of distance from God is still present for him in verse 5. Do you wonder that with me? When you look at verse 5, don't you sense he's saying, God, there is forgiveness, but then he says, I'm waiting for you. And maybe you've had that experience too, where you're believing, but there's just something that you're still waiting for. It still feels as though it's nighttime. I have that experience lots of times where I have some moments where I'm joyful. It's almost as though it's as close to day as it can be until the Lord returns. And other moments where it just feels like the night. My, my heart feels like it's in the dark. There's still a sense of uncertainty. There's unrest. There's a sense of, of insecurity that's present in my emotions. And so I have to say to the Lord, I am waiting for you, Lord. Sometimes our expression of hope that God has forgiven us in light of the severity of our sin requires perseverance. I remember a time, um, man, I was, this is a long time ago, but it just stuck in my mind as a profound moment for my faith. I, I was experiencing some conviction about some kind of sin, and I, I just was doubting. I was doubting God's love towards me, God's favor towards me in Christ, and I just couldn't get that out of my heart. I just was there. I, I believe, no, I think I'm forgiven. I've confessed the sin. I'm, I'm trying to follow you, Lord. But it just was there. It was as though doubt was just there, ready for me. If I wasn't actively trusting, I would be actually falling into doubt. And I remember just sitting and, 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 and singing the lines of that song before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. It's written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. I was singing it but it was taking everything in me to believe it. I believe that's true. I believe that's true. And if I stopped saying I believe it's true, it would start to seem untrue. I believe there is forgiveness. I believe when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because my sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. 
I, I believe that's true. I don't feel its truth right now, but I believe it's true. It's just like this marvelous image of a watchman who is peering out into the darkness of the night with all of its insecurities, especially in that culture, and and suspicions and, and, and uncertainties of the future. And yet he knows there is a dawn coming with all of its security and, and certainty and sight. Right now it's dark and the darkness lingers and I have to wait for the full experience of the hope that I've placed in God. But I know the dawn is coming. Brothers and sisters, when we experience conviction of sin, now if we ignore sin, you're never going to need to wait for God's forgiveness because we don't think we need it. But when we genuinely experience conviction of sin and express faith in God's forgiveness, sometimes that faith has to endure through nights of the soul where we have to declare words like that with faith when everything in our heart says, how do you know this is true? We say it sometimes weeping and sometimes clinging to the promises of God's salvation. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness. The great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself, I shall not die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ, my Savior and my God. And we say those words with faith, and then we say them again because we can sense the doubt of night creeping in again. But it's not maturity to experience the absence of any temptation of doubt. Many godly Christians experience the temptation to doubt God's love and God's forgiveness and God's mercy. Maturity comes by enduring faith in the promises of God. He has enduring faith in God's promises. And he also has a compelling witness to God's redemption. Notice where he turns. And notice still that we don't have any evidence in this psalm that his emotions, his experience has changed. There's no reference that he's been delivered in some tangible way. Do you notice that? I find great hope in that. Notice that in between the space between six and seven, it doesn't say, you answered me. I heard your voice declaring over me your love. You, you, you notice that he doesn't say that. Or something like, I have seen the redemption of the Lord. I called and you answered me. You notice it doesn't have that? When you see that's not there. So we don't know for sure. But what we do know is he goes from waiting to witnessing about God's redemption, whether or not he is currently experiencing it. Do you notice that? I think there is something of hope and faith that God does in our hearts only when we turn from looking at our sin or even from our waiting and move towards declarations and a witness to others of God's redemption. In this case, he is speaking to the covenant community. He is telling them there is redemption in God. There's something that happens in my soul when I tell you there is forgiveness in God. I think that's true for this man as well. He's aware of his need for mercy. He's aware that without mercy, he's lost. He's aware that his experience of seeing mercy is, is, is an issue of faith for him and not sight. So what does he do next? Does he go back and do the same round again? No. First, he turns to others and begins to declare to them that there is redemption for needy, drowning sinners in the Lord. Oh, Israel, he says. Hope in the Lord. There's that wonderful name of God, Yahweh, the Lord of covenant faithfulness. Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. There's that wonderful word. God's covenant, patient, perfect love that reaches out to drowning sinners again and again and holds them up to himself. With him is plentiful redemption. 
Redemption meaning the purchase back from slavery and death and hopelessness and bringing into a place of freedom and protection. With him, there are these things. And notice the confidence in verse 8. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. He will do it. Notice it's still future. He will do it. So that's where I think this man, he's not in a place of having just seen some tangible deliverance. He's still expressing faith. He's just turning to others around him and saying, the Lord is merciful and gracious. He will give steadfast love to those who are in need. He will lift you up from the watery grave that you're in because of sin. He will redeem you. He will purchase you. He will rescue you. Even though his own soul might still be feeling as though it's waiting and clinging to promises, he's now going to declare to others what he believes by faith, whether or not he is experiencing it by sight. Listen, there there is a good encouragement here for any Christian who consistently battles with depression, with a sense of the darkness of the soul. There is a, a, a certain gift of God in our calling to build up others in faith when our faith is struggling. Listen, if, if you struggle with just doubt, maybe in, 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 a, in an above average kind of way, at least it seems to you, that it, man, it just clings to you. It doesn't matter how many songs you sing, books you read, messages you listen to. When you go home tomorrow, you will have heard this message, and yet there it is again. Some doubt is just right there. It's nagging at you. The, the emotional sense that God is distant. You don't believe he's distant, but man, it feels like he's distant. You feel hopeless. Look, there, there is something in this psalmist that is a gift to us that sometimes, yes, we confess our sins to the Lord. Yes, we acknowledge that apart from his mercy, we would have nothing. Yes, we declare that he has forgiveness in God for all of our sin. But then we also turn to others and say, hope in the Lord. Listen, if you can say hope in the Lord to others when your own soul is still waiting, I believe God will use that in your heart as part of how he sustains you. Often, when we're experiencing the night and the morning has not come yet, you know what often doubt tells us to do? Isolate. No one can understand my loneliness. No one understands how long the night is. No one understands the darkness of my soul. No one understands the depths of my sin. No one could really get why it would be a legitimate question that God would not forgive me. No one can get that. The best thing I can do is to be alone. And sometimes you even can hear a voice saying, be alone with God. But God has given us the gift of people both so they can speak into us and so that we can speak into them. And he does something in our heart when we declare to others, with the Lord there is plentiful redemption. So if your tendency, especially in, in that battle with depression, doubt, the, the darkness of night, I'm not seeing or feeling the light of his forgiveness, don't isolate Follow the example of this psalmist who turns to the brotherhood, the sisterhood of the Lord and declares, with the Lord there is, I believe this by faith, he will redeem. He will redeem from all of our iniquities. He will redeem. He will rescue. He will bring us to the place where there is only day and never night. He will bring us there, brothers and sisters, he will He becomes a compelling witness to God's redemption. John Stott says, helpfully, I think, describing this psalm, there is nothing morbid about the confession of sins so long as we go on to give thanks for the forgiveness of sins. It is fine to look inwards as long as it leads us immediately to look outwards and upwards Again, great dangers in Christians who never look inwards. They're like sailors saying, we're holding our own while they go down. But also danger in Christians who only ever look inwards and never look upwards or outwards. 
our regular pattern of conversation with the Lord. And again, let me speak to you. If you've been a Christian a long time, ask the question, is this an actual conversation or is it just a thought of a conversation that I should have? You know, you know the difference? Yeah, I know that's the right thing to do, but it's different than actually doing it. Yeah, I should, you know, oh yeah, totally. Fan of confession, a fan of acknowledging God's forgiveness, a fan of encouraging others. But it's been weeks, months, years since you actually sat in a real physical spot, actually communicated to the Lord, my sins continue to be many. I need your forgiveness. And when you have provided your forgiveness in Jesus, and now, Lord, give me grace to declare about your forgiveness to others. If you're not actually doing it, you're just affirming that that's a really good idea. That is not the same thing. It's not the same thing about this guy thinking about writing this psalm and actually writing it. It's not the same thing about thinking about talking with the Lord and actually talking to him, thinking about confessing sin and actually confessing it. Feeling bad about sin is not a transaction with God. Conversations where you both confess and then affirm forgiveness with you. There is redemption, redemption that I believe and then letting that flow out to others, that should be the regular pattern of our walk with Lord. There is nothing more but about the confession of sins. So long as we go on to give thanks for the forgiveness of sins, it's fine to look inwards, as long as it leads us immediately to look outwards and upwards. Listen, consider the glory of this psalm like we've done in many of the psalms with the greater revelation we have of God's redemption in Jesus and how much more motivating this psalm is in light of the fact that God's redemption is ultimately revealed in him. Consider when you're crying from the depths that there is one who actually went to the depths of our own condemnation to save us. We feel condemned. He was condemned. In my opinion, it would be better for us to preserve the word condemnation. I feel condemned. We don't actually feel condemned. We might feel guilty. We might feel distant. Only Jesus ever felt condemned. Condemnation was not a feeling. It was a fact. He was actually alienated from God. He didn't feel alienated. He was alienated. Very different experience. Consider that this one who actually was condemned knows the depths of condemnation in a way that we will never, because of his grace, experience. We feel guilty. He was declared guilty in our place. Consider why we know that if God marked iniquities, we could not stand because Christ did not stand being marked by our iniquities. How do you know that God would condemn you if he marked your iniquities? Because he marked his son with the iniquities of Christians. And even with it being his son, that person went to the grave. Listen, if my sins on Jesus were enough to send Jesus to the grave under God's wrath, then certainly my sins on me are enough to send me to the grave. How do we know that if we were marked, God would send us to his judgment because he sent Christ to his judgment who was marked in our place. My sins marked him on the cross and he fell under God's judgment. How do we know that there is forgiveness in God? A forgiveness that should produce awe and worship, the fear of the Lord. Because we hear the Savior himself saying as the image of God, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. How do we know that God is a forgiving God? Because Jesus, God the Son, forgave those who nailed him to the cross. Listen, if Jesus could forgive those nailing him to the cross, then there is certainly forgiveness in the Lord. How can we have enduring confidence in the dark night of our soul? Because the Savior who was the light of the world was plunged into darkness and yet rose again. He bore the darkness for us and assures us that one day we will see his face and night will be no more. And now, as we walk this road, this regular road, let repentance be a well-worn road in your soul. 
Just the regular experience. Oh, Lord, I have, I have sinned again, yet again. I've gone under the temptation of sin. Let it be a well-worn road because then you experience again the joy of affirming the plentiful redemption provided in Jesus. Listen, if you never experience the sorrow of sin, you don't get fresh experiences of the joy of your salvation. The man who is drowning, is, he's not finally afraid of revealing that he's drowning. He's afraid of drowning. The saint is not afraid of revealing that he's a sinner. He's afraid of being permanently plunged under by his sin. That's what it means to be a Christian, that we hate sin more than we hate the exposure of our sin. No person drowning feels embarrassed to crawl out for help. And no Christian who is sinning should feel more embarrassed about calling out for help than continuing to give in to the sin that required Jesus to die on the cross. Brothers, whether this is private confession with the Lord, confession with our spouse, confession with those we know and love, it's sharing, look, I'm struggling with this, and yet I am claiming and pleading for God's mercy and trusting in it. Repentance is not finally drudgery, pointless Christian moralism. No, it's a journey. It's a journey that leads to a celebration of God's mercy. It, it's an it's a expression that culminates in a joyful rescue and a reminder of the ultimate rescue we have in Jesus. Look, if you never walk this road, you're missing out on the glory of verse 7 and 8 where we rejoice in the mercy of God. If you've been neglecting or ignoring or postponing a conversation with the Lord that includes reference to your sin, look, get to it! Because 7 and 8 is the reward of the repentant soul. 7 and 8 celebrates the mercy and the redemption of God. You cannot see the glory of Christ unless you see the cost of his salvation. In seeing that cost with regular confession, we enjoy and celebrate the plentiful redemption he has provided for us. James Rowe wrote the following poem. It was turned into a hymn. Could be almost a retelling of this psalm in our version of poetry. He says this, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for those that experience the ongoing temptation of doubt of your forgiveness. I pray that you would reassure them right now of the forgiveness available because of your death on the cross and your resurrection. Lord, bring light to souls that feel they are continually waiting. Lord, I pray for those who can't remember the last time they had a conversation like this psalm with you. Lord, that compel them. Compel them to enjoy a fresh reminder of your mercy. Lord, anoint all of us, Lord, to be those who witness to your redemption to one another. May we declare to each other that we can hope in you that there is bountiful, abundant redemption in you. Receive our gratefulness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you battle with that clinging sense of, of, of doubt that's just always there, I would love to pray for you. We would love to pray for you. Community group leaders and wives will be here. We'd just love to ask that God would give you relief from that. And if it's been a long time since you remember having a conversation like this with the Lord, 
and you want to have that moment with somebody else just for a form of accountability, come forward at the end. Let us pray for you. Ask that God would do that right now. And this, this would be a moment that you can remember. For the rest of you, have a grace-filled week. We'll see you at community group or next Sunday. Thank you, baby. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Thank you, baby.